Well, hi everyone. Here's our first try at having a, a, an online class video. Today we're going to talk about the basics of macroeconomics. So I'm going to be toggling back and forth between some PowerPoint slides and some, some whiteboard material, and um, we'll see how it goes. So again, we're going to, going to be now talking about the basics of macroeconomics. Macro is the big picture. So we're looking at pretty much things that affect countries or the international perspective of economics. So we're going to include things like overall production as opposed to individual production. We're going to talk about things like the unemployment rate for an entire country as opposed to whether or not you are unemployed. We're going to be talking about price levels for all goods as opposed to the price of a particular good. So the macroeconomics, macroeconomics is the big picture as opposed to or contrary to microeconomics, which was what was going on with individuals or individual companies. So let's move forward. So when we look at macroeconomics, there are three big numbers that we want to pay attention to. One of those numbers is the first number that you see here, 3.5%. So think about this for a second. What might that number be in the context of macroeconomics? Well, if you said the unemployment rate, then you are exactly correct. The unemployment rate at the national level is currently 3.5%. The next number is a little bit harder to identify. It's the number that students have that are the least likely to to know what it means. It's 0.1% right now. That number is the inflation rate. Inflation is the pace at which prices as a whole across the country are increasing. And right now it's really, really, really low. Just 0.1% per month. Now the last number on our list is 2.1%. 2.1% is the economic growth rate. So that is how quickly our economy is expanding, or at least how quickly the economy was expanding in the last three months of the year 2019. These three numbers, the unemployment rate, the inflation rate, and the growth rate, are the big numbers in macroeconomics. And we're going to spend a lot of time trying to understand where these numbers come from and what they mean for us. One of the things that distinguishes macroeconomics from microeconomics is that macroeconomics is much less settled than microeconomics. For decades and decades and decades, economists have agreed upon the, the way that markets work with demand and supply. And we've talked a lot about um, things like marginal cost and marginal revenue and finding that profit maximizing point. Those are all things that most economists agree upon. But when we get to the macroeconomic level, we're talking about something entirely different because there is a question, first of all, of what should be done at the macro level in terms of trying to stabilize the economy. So let's talk about that idea of stabilization here for just a second. And then we're going to get back to these two characters. When we talk about economic stability, what we're talking about is a specific goal and objective of government. Economic stability is said to occur when you have economic growth along with full employment in an inflationless environment. So you have economic growth with full employment in an inflation-less environment. This is actual 
public policy for the United States. We can go back to the, to the post-World War II era, where coming out of not only World War II, but also the Great Depression, the United States government passed in 1946 something called the Employment Act. It is this act that put into play or put into practice the goal of achieving economic stability through government means when necessary. Now this, you have to understand, this is an incredibly, an incredibly curious change in the position of the government in terms of its relationship with economics. Because up until the Great Depression, really, the role that government played at the macroeconomic level was essentially um, minimalist. There was very little, if anything, that the federal government did other than to control the money supply. And that, that in and of itself was a very new thing at the beginning of the Great Depression. The federal government did not get involved at the macro level. There was just no reason for it to. There was no theory that supported government getting involved at the macro level. So, so they didn't. But when the Great Depression struck, people's perceptions of the role of government changed dramatically. So let's talk a little bit about where that change comes from and who precipitated that change. To understand the difference in perceptions, we have to understand something about these two guys. This guy over here on the left is a guy named John Maynard Keynes. If you're going to know any names relative to macroeconomics, you've got to know this guy's name. John Maynard Keynes. He is the father of macroeconomics. We talked a little bit about Adam Smith as him being kind of the godfather of all of economics, but macroeconomics in and of itself is, is really this guy's brainchild. John Maynard Keynes, he's a British economist who studied economics in England and studied it as everyone else had studied it, but he, he perceived some curiosities about the way economists were looking at things, in particular the big picture. But because there was really no, no reason to change the way things were going, Keynes didn't have much of a leg to stand on in terms of his ideas. But when the Great Depression hit, Keynes stood up and waved his hands and said, look, I've got a solution for this problem. We need to get government more involved in the macro economy. And he kind of coined that term, the macro economy. And because of one other thing that he did in his life, uh, people found him to be somewhat credible. You see, Keynes was part of the contingency from the British government who went to sign the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. And because of a lot of the things that the governments were imposing upon Germany and Austria, Keynes said, look, this is not the right plan. You cannot force these people to pay you back. They're not, they don't have any money. Their countries have been devastated. They don't have the productive capacity to make any money. And all they're going to do is print money and cause massive inflation. And that's probably going to lead to some crazy maniac stepping up and saying, we can't pay these people back. We won't pay them back. Let's start another war. And his unintended consequences of the peace, Keynes essentially predicted the rise of Hitler. He didn't know it was Hitler himself, but he, he, he predicted the rise of, of this, of this uh, fascist dictator. And so people saw that. They, they kind of recognized that from, from his writings earlier and say, oh, this guy, he's back. Maybe he does have something valuable to say, something valuable to listen to. Now, on the other side, we have this guy right here, a much less famous fellow known as Friedrich Hayek, or just F.A., Hayek. And Hayek is someone who initially looked at Keynes and thought, Keynes is the greatest. He really understands things because Hayek was from Austria and he was experiencing the massive inflation that Keynes had predicted in Austria at the time. But then 
Hayek started to disagree with Keynes, and he disagreed very vigorously. He looked at Keynes's perception or prescriptions to fix the economy and said, you know what? It's not more government that we need. It's actually less government that we need because governments can't change. They can't, they're not organic. They are not flexible enough. What you need is more market solutions to macro problems, not more government. And so these two guys really butted heads and started to form in economics what we refer to as different schools of thought. Schools of thought in macroeconomics are one of the things that distinguishes macro from micro. Because people don't agree with what should be done to fix problems, there are different ways of thinking about the economy. So on one side, we have what are called, what's called the Keynesian school, named after, of course, John Maynard Keynes. The Keynesian school of macroeconomics is one that advocates for a fair amount of government intervention. They're not socialist, they're not communist, but it's more so that we just need government to step in and, as we talked about before, fix some of the problems that markets may not be able to fix. Hayek, on the other hand, says, oh no, that's not the right way to go about it, and we need uh, limited government, if any government, and the Hayek perspective has been known as the Austrian School of Economics because Hayek and, um, and people who followed Hayek were from, mainly from Austria, at least to start with. So we have these kind of two different perspectives on the world. And there are uh, other schools of thought that fall somewhere in between. But on the one end, for government intervention, we have Keynesian. And on the other side, for lot, a lot less government intervention, we have the Austrian School of Economics. What we're going to do is we're going to cover the basics of macro. And when we get into policy, we'll talk a little bit about how these two guys come back into play as far as what they suggest and what they recommend in terms of stimulating the economy. But for now, it's good to know that when we get as we get into macro, there are things that people do not agree upon. And, um, and that's part of the fun of macroeconomics is that people have opinions and it's, it's kind of fun to listen to those opinions. Okay, so let's take a look now at the three big, most important topics in macroeconomics. The three things that we're trying to um, trying to bring together, trying to um, understand so that we can um, we can start to put the pieces of this big thing called the macro economy together. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a look at employment. Employment is of the macroeconomic variables that we consider. Employment's the one that hits people the most directly because if you lose your job, it's really, really painful. If prices go up a little bit, it's not that big of a deal. And macroeconomic growth can certainly help the macro economy, but it may not hit you where you live in terms of your micro day-to-day -day activities. But employment is certainly one of those, is certainly something that, that can have an, in, uh, an impact on you. And when we look at employment, the macroeconomic variable that we are concerned about is what's called the unemployment rate. So as we look at the unemployment rate, what we're going to try to figure out is, first of all, who counts as unemployed, because not everybody does. You think it would be, well, if you don't have a job, that's unemployed, but not necessarily. Um, the way we count unemployment is a little bit peculiar. So let's take a look at this uh, this peculiar statistic. First of all, what is the unemployment rate? The unemployment rate is equal to the number of unemployed people. This is not hashtag unemployed. This is the number of unemployed people divided by something we call the labor force. That is equal to the unemployment rate. So what you know, what does that mean and, and where do those, you know, what, what are the different parts of this um, equation? What, what do those things really actually mean? Um, to understand that, let's take a look at what it means to be unemployed. To be unemployed, you can't have a job. That kind of goes without saying, you would think. 
this young lady certainly is unemployed. Well, I think she's unemployed. She says she needs a job, and that's a signal that she doesn't have one and that she wants one. But to actually be unemployed, she needs to have one other characteristic, and that is she needs to be looking for work. You need to be looking for work, and if you're not looking for work, you're not technically unemployed. So based upon this picture, we would presume that she's she doesn't have a job and she's looking for work because she has this sign and that's a signal to potential employers that she wants a job. So she would be unemployed. But if she was you know, sitting around on a couch somewhere, you know, watching uh, Judge Judy and not looking for a job, then technically she would not be unemployed. So to be unemployed, you have to have no job first and then you have to be looking for work. Let's take a look at unemployment. So where we, what we're looking at here is the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The Bureau of Labor Statistics is the, um, is the official organization that counts the unemployment rate. And as you can see on the BLS website, so just bls.gov, it tells us a lot of information. So here's, for example, where we got the inflation statistic. Consumer Price Index, which we'll talk about short, shortly, tells us how quickly prices are rising. And here's the unemployment rate, 3.5% in February of 2020. So that's our current unemployment rate, but what does that tell us about how many people are unemployed? Not very much, it just tells us 3.5% of the labor force. So I'm gonna click on the unemployment rate here, and I'm going to look at the unemployment tables, that all of this data that the Bureau of Labor Statistics provides for us. Um, let's take a look here at the unemployment statistics by race, sex, and age. And what we can see is that um, we have a bunch of information here based on ethnicity. So we have the white labor force, men and women, and, and, um, and age groups. We also have uh, African American and we have Asian. So there's information on these different groups and it, one of the things you will notice is that the numbers are not the same for every group. For example, if we look at the unemployment rate for the white population in February, it was only 3.1 percent. But for the African American population, the overall unemployment rate is 5.8 percent, substantially higher. And if we look at the Asian unemployment rate, it's only 2.5%, which is substantially lower than the white unemployment rate. So we've got these different rates for different groups within the economy. Let's take a look at some specific numbers here about the total of the country. So uh, now I'm in table A1, and what I can see here is that the unemployment rate is 3.5% right here. But how many people are actually unemployed? Well, if I look at the number right above that, it tells me how many people are unemployed. Five, and this, these are numbers in thousands. So this, would, this is saying that there are five, a little under 5.8 million people unemployed in the United States. So the number of unemployed people would be 5,787,000. And they round that a little. But to get the unemployment rate, I need to take that number and divide it by the labor force. So the other number I need is this, the civilian labor force. The civilian labor force in February of 2020 was 164,546,000 people. Now, if you know anything about the United States, you know that that is not the population of the country. The population is considerably higher than that, and it's almost double that. So the civilian labor force is not every person in the country. The civilian labor force is a specific group of people within the country. So let's take a look 
at who those people are. So what I've done here is I've just taken that data from the BLS web page and I've put it into the uh, onto the whiteboard here. And if we take that number, 5,787,000 divided by 164,546,000, we get our 3.5%. That's our unemployment rate. But again, who are these people? Who are these people in the labor force? If the unemployed people are the people who are looking for work and can't find a job, then the labor force is equal to those people who are unemployed plus the people who are employed. So if we look at all of the people who have jobs and all of the people who don't have jobs but want them and add them together, that's where we get the 164,546,000. People in the labor force. Now you might say to yourself, now that still doesn't tell me a whole lot. That doesn't give me a whole lot of information about what's going on in terms of who the people are. So let's take a look at one last thing about who is counted in the labor force. So who's in the labor force? Well, again, to be part of the labor force, you have to be either employed or unemployed. But there is a significant group of people who are not counted no matter what. People who are not part of the labor force. And this gets kind of to the heart of macroeconomic statistics. There are just some things that are too hard to count. And... To make the job of counting easier, we have to kind of trim some things. So when it comes to not counting people, some of the people that we don't count are people who don't want jobs. They don't want jobs because they've already had jobs. So we don't count any people who are retired. They're not looking for work. We also don't count anybody under the age of 16. We presume that their job is to go to school, they're not looking for work, and there are certain labor laws um, that prohibit people from under the age of 16 from working. So we don't count under the age of 16. So we don't count the young, and we don't count the old. We also don't count people who are disabled, who can't work. So if you're disabled, if you're sick, if um, there's something wrong that prevents you from working, you're not going to be part of the labor force. We do not count full-time students, so many of you do not count in the labor force. If you're a full-time college student, even if you have a job in some cases, you're not part of the labor force. If you are in jail and cannot work because you are incarcerated, you are not part of the labor force. And if you are in the military, you're not part of the labor force because this is counting civilian employees. It's not that you're not doing something valuable. Of course, that's not the case. But you are not considered part of the labor force. You're a special category. There's one other group of people who are not counted as part of the labor force that makes the computations a little bit fishy. And those are people who we call discouraged workers. Discouraged workers are not in jail, and discouraged workers are not disabled. They're not retired or under the age of 16. They're not in the military. Discouraged workers are simply people who don't have jobs. They were looking for work, but they gave up. And once they give up, they are no longer part of the labor force, which means they are no longer considered unemployed, which might make you scratch your head and say, what in the world are people actually counting here? Well, it just so happens that the Bureau of Labor Statistics understands this problem. And so they actually have different ways of measuring unemployment. 
the typical way that we look at unemployment, the, the, the number that we are looking at no, most normally is actually something called U3 unemployment. This is the official unemployment rate. But there are other measures of unemployment that include progressively more people in the unemployment rate. If we were to look at this category U6, what we are including in that unemployment statistic are people who have part-time jobs but would want but want full-time jobs and we include discouraged workers those people who are what we call um, marginally attached to the labor force and if you look at that number that number is actually quite a bit higher so this is remember you three are the people who don't have jobs uh, and are looking but U6 says, what about those people who want jobs but have given up looking? And what about those people who aren't getting as many hours as they would like to have? They're actually not being fully employed. So that number, that U6 number is 7%, double what the official unemployment statistic is. So one of the things that is important to understand when we look at unemployment and any of the macroeconomic variables is what is actually included in those numbers? The reports that you will hear in the news give you the U3, the official unemployment statistic, but that does not include a lot of people who we would really consider to be unemployed. So, what does this all mean? Is 3.5% high? Well, it's not nearly as high as 7%, but if we were to look at unemployment over the last few years, we would see that unemployment rates have actually dropped rather significantly. Here is a table of data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics that give us the unemployment rate since 1990. And here's a graph that shows it a little bit more uh, concretely. We see that there are times when the unemployment rate gets high. This is the U3, the, the typical, the normal unemployment rate. And in the mid 90s, there was a peak and then it went down, 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 down. And then in the early 2000s, we saw a peak and then it went down and then we saw the Great Recession where the unemployment rate went up over 9%, which is an enormous, enormously high unemployment rate. And since then, it has, been diminished, uh, it has decreased significantly. And if we were to go back even further, as far back as we can go, at least with the Bureau of Labor Statistics data, we see that there are, there are oftentimes these peaks and valleys of unemployment. And we are at a near... 70 year low in unemployment. Unemployment is really, really, really low right now. And that brings us to our last topic as far as unemployment is concerned. Unemployment is a common thing. It's, it's a thing that we can't really get rid of. We don't want to necessarily get rid of it because there are different types of unemployment. One type of unemployment is something we call structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is a normal kind of unemployment. It is worrisome to economists because it tends to last longer than other kinds of employment. Because structural unemployment is a result of changes to the underlying structure of the economy. So in the case of structural unemployment, People have skills that are no longer wanted or needed. So people's skills are essentially 
outdated. And you can think of things like uh, steel workers or newspaper reporters or blacksmiths or buggy, uh, buggy manufacturers or all of these jobs that we used to need a lot of, but now we don't need many anymore. Those are structural changes in the economy. And so the people who lose their jobs find it very hard to go out and get a new job in that particular area. Sometimes when we talk about structural unemployment, we talk about an idea called creative destruction. Creative destruction is this idea that as economies grow and develop and change and new things get created, old things get destroyed, old things go away. So we don't need typewriter repairmen anymore, and we don't need VCR repairmen anymore. And, um, and there are just things that we don't have, things that we don't need anymore. We don't need uh, relay technicians on the telegraph anymore because the economy has changed. So when we have structural unemployment, it is a natural function of an economy that's going through some changes. It's not, not that it makes it any less painful to be unemployed because of this, but uh, it is a natural thing that happens. Another natural kind of unemployment is what we call frictional unemployment. And frictional unemployment is a type of unemployment that is really short-term in nature. It doesn't last very long. Because the workers do have skills employers want. The reason frictional unemployment exists is primarily because it takes time to match employers with employees. It takes time to match employees and employers. And even though the internet helps this uh, process to happen more quickly, you can put your resume on any number of job sites and um, and and that will help you to find an employer more quickly, it still takes time. There's paperwork that needs to be filled out. There are interviews that need to be undertaken. It just takes a little bit of time. Um, these two types of unemployment, the frictional and the structural, form what we call the natural unemployment rate, or just natural unemployment. These are things that happen in an economy, and it's not bad to have them. Part of the frictional unemployment, for example, is when people quit a job to start another one. They want something better. They want something that pays more. They want to move to a new location, and they become unemployed for a period of time, but they're going to find a job because they have skills employers want. So the natural unemployment rate for a country should never be zero. There should always be people looking for new jobs. And there should, hopefully, always be creative destruction so that some older jobs are no longer needed because the economy is moving forward. These are natural types of unemployment, and it's just fine to have them. We know our economy is in trouble, however, if we have the other kind of unemployment, something we call cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is unemployment that happens when the economy is doing bad, when the economy is poor. When that happens, people lose their jobs and there aren't other jobs to move to. This is a situation where the economy stinks and if you lose your job, no one is hiring. So you're going to be out of work. And it may be that you're out of work a long time. How long it lasts is uncertain. How long it lasts depends upon something that is more involved with our next part of macroeconomics. The part of that macroeconomics that we call GDP or gross domestic product. So that's our first major macroeconomic topic, unemployment. We're now going to move on to the second topic, which is maybe the one that gives us the best indication of the overall health of the economy. We look at this statistic called gross domestic product, or GDP, 
And we use that particular statistic in a number of different ways to try to get a feel for what's going on overall in the economy. So let's, let's take a look at this, this GDP statistic and see all of the different important things that GDP does for us. So GDP is defined as the market value of all final goods and services produced within a country over a given period of time. That's GDP, or gross domestic product. But each part of this um, definition has something that we want to pay attention to. So let's first of all examine this concept or this notion of market value. What we're looking at, usually when we look at GDP, is, is some dollar amount. Now the way we look at GDP can be examined in a couple of different ways. We're going to focus on, for now, this dollar amount of the market value. So it's what does the market determine the value of these final goods and services are? And that's the second part that I want to focus on, the idea of final goods and services, but particularly this word final. When we look at the production of something, there are different stages of production. But we don't want to count all of those stages of production, because if we do, we can end up double counting some things. For example, let's say that we're looking at the production of a car. So here's a car. And most companies, when they produce a car, they don't produce every single piece of the automobile themselves. Most companies do not produce tires. They buy the tires from somebody else. The problem is, in counting GDP, if we count the market value of the tire when, say, um, Ford buys tires to put on their cars or their trucks, and then count the market value of the car or truck when it is sold, we're really counting that tire twice. And we don't want to do that. We only want to count goods and services produced once. Because if we count things twice, then GDP is going to look a lot bigger than it really is. So we need to count the final goods and services. So we want to just count the car when it is sold because the car includes the tires and the electronics and everything else that goes into that car. So we're only going to count the final sale of the goods and services. Now the third thing is that we are looking at production that happens within a country. So in this case, geography is very important. Where does the production take place? Not necessarily who is the owner of the production, but where does it take place? Sticking with the example of a car, for example, we have uh, different companies in the United States that produce cars. We have Ford, we have General Motors, but we also have Toyota and Honda and BMW and those companies, BMW, Honda, and, and Toyota, they're not American companies. But that doesn't matter. When we look at GDP, gross domestic product, what we're worried about is where does the production take place? And because it's domestic production, all we care about is does it take place within the borders of a country? Then finally, we have over a given period of time. The production of a car typically doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot that goes into the development of a car from the uh, original drawings of what the car is going to look like to when it rolls off the assembly line. And if we were to take a snapshot of production, we might say that there are never any cars produced because there's never one single day where the car is actually produced. Most production, or a lot of production at least, takes place over a longer period of time. And so we evaluate GDP over a long period of time to take into account a lot of things. 
the production, the timeline of production, for example. And, I mean, imagine what things would look like if we were to just evaluate GDP on a Friday when people are looking forward to the weekend. Or if we look at GDP on the Monday after the Super Bowl, we would just not have a really good picture of what production looks like. So we look at it over a period of time, typically a year. We look at GDP over the course of a year. Now we'll get snapshots every three months to see what GDP is looking like. But typically what we want to do is measure GDP over this longer period of time from one year to the next. So when we look at GDP, this is what we're looking at. The market value of all final goods and services produced within a country over a given period of time. Now GDP is a really useful statistic. So let's take a look at why that is so useful by looking at by looking at ah, here we go three different things that GDP does for us. One of the things that GDP does for us is it is a measure of output. This is the thing most people think of when they think of GDP, but there's something else that is part of that. I said GDP can be measured in a couple of different ways. One of the things that we measured, that we use to measure GDP, of course, is output. But we can also think of GDP as income, national income. Because GDP is the value of all final goods and services produced within a country over a given period of time, that's the output side. But as people are producing those things, it generates income for the producers. Let's go back to something we looked at a long time ago now, the circular flow model. Remember, we had households and firms, and then we had our two markets. We had our, um, our product market up here. We had our resource market down here. And then we had this flow of goods and services. So firms produce products. They sold them to households, and then households provided resources, and those resources ended up in the firm. So we had this, this circle of goods and services going in one direction, but we also said if we added money in here, we would get a better picture of what's going on in the real world. So households take money to the product market, that money becomes income to the firm, and the firm uses that to buy resources, and those res that money that the firm spends on the resources ends up as money in the pockets of the household. We can use this circular flow model to think about GDP. The top half of this model, where the households are paying for the things that the firms produce, this is the dollar value of output. It's the money that people spend on goods and services. But we also have this lower half of the model where the money ends up in the, in the pockets of the household. And so this is basically the dollar value of income. So we can measure GDP as the dollar value of output or the dollar value of income. They should be the same. That being said, it means we have two different ways to measure GDP. We can measure it through the value of output, or we can use it to measure the value of income. That also means there are two different ways that we can count GDP. One is called the expenditures approach to GDP. And the expenditures approach is to measure the value of output. The other way to measure GDP is through what's called the income approach. And here we measure the value of income. And again, these two things should be equal to each other. And because they're equal to each other, it doesn't matter which one of these we use. So it would behoove us to use the easier of the two methods. And there is one of these two methods that is far, far easier to use.
and that is the expenditures approach. So that's what we're going to do when we look at GDP. We're going to measure GDP through the expenditures approach. So GDP can be used as a measure of output. That being said, we do have to be somewhat careful about what we are doing with that GDP and how we interpret that GDP. So as part of this idea of output, we can assume that output is a way to identify standard of living. How well off are people? And usually what we want to say is that the higher the GDP, the higher the standard of living. But we need to be careful about that because sometimes that information can be somewhat misleading. So let's take a look at a couple of different countries and see how GDP can be misleading if we use it the wrong way. But before we do that, I want to take a look at that expenditures approach and, and how we measure output. When we measure GDP, we do it through a calculation, a computation. And this is the expenditures approach to GDP. We have GDP is equal to C plus I plus G plus NX. So what do those values stand for? Well, the first is C. C is consumption. I'll explain what these each mean here in just a second. I is investment, G is government spending, and NX stands for net exports. So what do, what do each one of these things mean for us? Well, when we look at GDP and these different parts of GDP, we see that they basically represent different parts of the overall economy. C stands for consumption, and consumption is basically the stuff that households buy. So most of the stuff that you buy is considered consumption spending. There are some exceptions, which I'll get to shortly. But when we look at consumption spending, we oftentimes break it down into different subgroups. One are the durable goods that we buy. These are things that are expected to last more than three years. And that's just a general rule of thumb. So your car, your clothes, your uh, most of your electronics, these are tend to be big ticket items, dishwashers, um, the furnace for your house, the, um, the washing machine. Those are considered durable goods. We also have non-durable goods. And non-durable goods are expected to last less than three years. These are things like gasoline and food. Things that, um, and I guess in a lot of cases, clothes there as well. Um, so there is some overlap between the goods. But um, for the most part, we're looking at things that are expected to last more than three years or less than three years. And, and that is distinguished by whether they're durable or non-durable goods. And that's going to play into something we see here in a few minutes when we talk about another role for GDP. We also include in consumption services. Services are things that you pay other people to do for you. So if you pay someone to come and mow the lawn, if you pay someone to babysit your kids, if you pay someone, you have a doctor bill or legal services, um, you go out to eat. These are things that you're paying someone else to do for you. Not that you can't do them for yourself, but you're paying somebody else to do them. So these are the things that are part of consumption. And one of the, one of the um, issues that will come up here in terms of what counts as GDP is uh, involves specifically some of these consumption components. The next part of GDP is I, which is investment. And investment is not what you probably think it is. This has nothing to do with stocks and bonds and saving for retirement. Investment is business spending. 
So when businesses spend things to grow their business, whether it's spending on equipment, on tools, on, um, on expanding their factory space or their warehouse space, um, they buy a new computer, any of that kind of stuff that helps a business work, that's considered investment spending because it's buying things that are going to be used to produce more stuff down the road. Investment is incredibly important. We'll talk more about the role of investment uh, in the macro economy a little bit later, but you have to have investment if you want to have any economic uh, growth at all. The exceptions that go under investment are anything that have to do with farms. So you buy a bale of barbed wire, you buy feed for the hogs, you buy a new tractor. It's not necessarily a business in the sense that we think of business but it is something that helps the farm run. So we include farm spending and investment. And we also include new home purchases. And by new home, I mean a house that no one has ever lived in before. So if you ever have the chance to build a house or just to be the first person to live in a house, that house and the market value of that house goes under investment. It's a special exemption, but because of the longevity of that particular item, it is included in investment. The next part of GDP is government spending. And this is the money the government spends. Now, governments buy stuff, but because it's government spending, they might buy the same things you do or same thing another business does. But because, again, it's a government, then... This is part of this category of spending. And we're going to talk more about sort of the role of government as we explore macroeconomics uh, along the way here. But what I want to note is that when we're talking about government, not everything government spends is part of the government component of GDP. Because GDP is trying to measure the value of things that are produced. So... We do not include things that are called transfer payments when we count government spending. If governments buy airplanes, if governments build roads or build schools, those are things that are produced. But transfer payments are not. And government spends a lot of money on transfer payments. What we're talking about here are things like Social Security, where basically you are transferring money from people who work to people who are retired. There's no production that takes place. It's just moving, moving money from one group to another. Uh, welfare would be another example of this, where we take money from people who are not working, who are who take money from people who are working and give it to people who are not working. Or Medicare or Medicaid, where we take money from healthy people and give it to sick people. These are transfer payments. These are things society says we should have, uh, and they have to be paid for, but there's no production involved with them. So we don't count these as part as as part of government of uh, GDP, even though it is government spending. The last area is what we call net exports. Again, this is the NX component of GDP. Net exports are the goods that we produce in the United States or whatever domestic country you're from minus the goods that we buy that are produced in other countries. So the exports for your country are production. And so we measure the value that people in other countries spend on these things. Imports are also production, but the, it is production in another country. So if we're measuring spending by people, we want to include the spending that people engage in on goods produced domestically. So if, say, um, let's say Microsoft produces a bunch of new software and they sell it all over the world, those are exports, and that should count as far as the U.S. production. But if Apple produces a bunch of iPhones in China and people in the United States buy those, because they were produced in China, we want to subtract that spending 
from GDP because it's not our domestic production. It's not the United States' domestic production. So net exports are exports minus imports. And of our numbers, this is the only one that can consistently be negative. If exports are greater than imports, then net exports are positive. But if exports are less than imports, then net exports are actually negative. And they've been negative in the United States for decades now. We buy a lot more stuff from people around the world than they buy from us. And it's just a mathematical reality. Whether that's good or bad is, is not something I want to talk about right now. It's just, it's just the math. So those are the components of GDP. We have consumption, we have investment, we have net exports, we have government spending, and then we have net exports. So those are our components of GDP. When we measure GDP, we're trying to get a feel for how much output is produced, and typically the more GDP we produce, the higher the standard of living in a country. But that may not always be the case, because if we measure GDP incorrectly, in context, we might have a problem. So let's take a look at some numbers in terms of GDP. Our first number is this one right here. 19 trillion, 390 billion, 604 million dollars. That's the market value of the goods and services produced in this particular country. Take about five seconds and see if you can Think about which country this might be. This is actually the country with the largest GDP in the world, and that is the United States. There it is. Good old USA. Now, the second number is also really, really big, $12,237,700,000,000. Trillion, this is the second place country in the world. And that would be China, of course. The third country on our list also has a huge GDP, over $2 trillion, $2.6 trillion of GDP. That's a lot of production. This country may not come right up, you know, may not come to the top of your mind, but this is another country that has, like China, has lots and lots and lots of people. So see if you can guess that one. If you guessed India, give yourself a cookie. Yeah, that's right. It's India. Now, the next country on our list is seems to be pretty small. This is a $62 billion economy, which compared to these first three is not very much. This country is a very tiny country in Europe. You may have never heard of it. This is the small little country of Luxembourg. They say, what, Luxembourg? What in the world? Why is Luxembourg on there? We'll get to that in a second. The final country on our list is also a as, as an even smaller GDP than the first four. This is a country with um, just a little over eight, $8 billion in GDP, which is, for some of the richest people in the world, um, this is a country actually produces less in value than some individuals have. This is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It shares an island in the Caribbean Ocean. This country is Haiti. So we have five countries with five very different GDPs. And the reason I have them up here is because if we're going to use GDP as a measure of the standard of living of a country, just looking at the numbers doesn't help us very much. We need to do, we need to make an adjustment to these numbers. And the adjustment that we make is said is to change or adjust these numbers to account for the population in a country. So if we looked at the United States and we looked at that $19 trillion of GDP and divided it by the population, 
we would have a much better gauge as to how much value is created per person in the country. So what we're doing here is we're doing something that's referred to as computing GDP per capita. The per capita GDP is the number that tells us, based on your population, what does output look like? So let's take a look at those numbers. In the United States, we have about 315 million people, and GDP per person in the United States is roughly $59,500. Not terrible. That basically says that every man, woman, and child in the United States, if we were to take the GDP and split it up equally, would have about $59,500. Now in China and India, of course, the populations are much, much larger. They're huge. So if we take, take the GDP and divide it by those billion or and more people, we see that China's GDP per person, even though their GDP as a country is really high, the GDP per person is actually quite small. It's just under $9,000. In India, it's even less. It's just under $2,000. That means that for every man, woman, and child in India, if we were to take the production, the value of production, and split it up, each person would have under $2,000. And now for Luxembourg and Haiti. Luxembourg is a really, really small country. And even though the GDP is much smaller, because they have so many fewer people, the GDP per person is going to be significantly different. In fact, Luxembourg has been one of the richest countries in the world over the last few decades because they have a lot of GDP per person, $104,103. Now, that's not to say that every person in Luxembourg has this amount of money. But what it does say is that we should expect the standard of living of people in Luxembourg to be much higher because of the production per person. Much higher, especially when we compare it to Haiti. Haiti has a really small GDP. They have more people than Luxembourg. And if we take that small GDP divided by the population, we see that in Haiti, the GDP per person is just under $800 per year. If we were to look at these countries and ask someone, based upon this information, where would you want to live? Where do you think your standard of living would be the highest? That standard of living is measured in terms of GDP per person. Luxembourg would have the highest relative standard of living, followed by the United States, China, India, and then poor, poor Haiti. So what's next? So the second thing we use GDP for. So the first thing was to look at standards of living and to measure economic um, output. The second thing is to measure economic growth. Economic growth tells us how quickly a country is growing in terms of their production. So this is a measure of, of rates of change. This is the question of how quickly Is an economy growing? And to do that, we take a very simple algebraic formula to find the percentage change of growth. We take GDP in a newer year, which I'm just going to label as a 2, minus GDP in an older year, which I measure as a 1, divided by GDP in that older year, Multiply it by 100, and that equals our growth rate. And if GDP is growing quickly, that's a sign of a vibrant economy. If GDP is growing slowly, that's a sign that an economy is growing, it's moving along, but it's, you know, it's just kind of moving along. If GDP growth rates are negative, it means your economy is actually shrinking, and that is really, really bad. If we were to put some numbers into this, let's just say that GDP in, um, in the new year was 110 and GDP in the old year was 100. 
we would take 100, 110 minus 100, that would give us 10 over 100, and to get a percentage, we multiply by 100 again, and that would tell us that this economy is growing at a rate of 10%. So that's what we use this particular formula for. Anytime we're looking at a change in, in rates, we're going to use this particular formula. But again, we've got a little problem here. We've got a problem because the way GDP is measured there's actually two things that could cause this growth rate. Remember what we're looking for when we look at GDP growth rates is we're trying to see, we're trying to see whether the value of what is produced is changing. But specifically, we want to know if we're producing more stuff. When we look at GDP, GDP is essentially found by taking the price of a good times the quantity of a good, and adding that to the price of some other good times the quantity of that other good, and doing that for as many goods as we produce in our country. So we take the price of apples times the quantity of apples, add that to the price of oranges times the quantity of oranges, and pineapple and grapefruit and, um, and radishes and cars and um, software, and everything that we produce. We're taking the price times the quantity, which means that GDP can go up for two reasons. GDP can increase if quantities rise, which is what we want to measure. This is what's really important. This is what we are trying to take into consideration. But GDP can also go up if prices go up, and this is not important. If it were, then all we have to do to increase GDP is make everything more expensive. And that's not what we want to do. We want to measure output changes. So when we look at GDP, there's actually two types of GDP, depending upon whether or not we are including the change in price in the measurements. One of those types of GDP is something that we call nominal GDP. And this is the one we have to be careful of because nominal GDP does not account for changes in price. Nominal GDP can go up because price change. You didn't account for that. You thought GDP went up because output increased, but in reality, it was just the changes in price. That's not what we want. We don't want this. This is, this is garbage GDP. Throw that away. Here's our garbage can. Put it in there. What we're really interested in, what we really want to take into consideration, what's really important it's what we call real GDP. And real GDP adjusts for changes in price. Real GDP is adjusted for changes in price. That's the one we want to pay attention to. Basically, what we're doing here is we are removing the influence of inflation. We're removing the influence of inflation and that's important. Now that can be a little bit complicated but there is a trick, there is a kind of a shortcut that we can use to account for this particular problem when it comes to GDP measurements. Here's the shortcut. If we want to change nominal GDP to make it real, so we're going to change nominal GDP to make it real. 
what we want to do is we want to take whatever the nominal rate is and subtract whatever the inflation rate is because inflation is telling us how quickly prices are rising. Nominal GDP tells us how quickly output is changing, but now we're going to subtract the influence of the change in price, and that's going to give us the real rate of change of GDP. For instance, between 2018 and 2019, US, real, or US nominal GDP increased by 3.7%. And people look at that number and they would say, wow, that is amazing. But part of what's going on there is there's a change in the price level. And during that time period, the inflation rate was 1.7%. So if we take the influence of price changes out, we get a real value of GDP increase of just 2.0%. GDP is going up, and that's good. But it's not going up at 3.7%. Our standard of living isn't changing at 3.7% because prices are going up too. So we need to account for that. Now the last little bit here in terms of measuring growth is that we have to be aware that growth rates don't change consistently over time. In some parts of the world, GDP does go up. And we see this in most developed countries where GDP goes up. It may not go up super fast, but it does go up over time. And in other places, other parts of the world, GDP doesn't go up at all. Sometimes in places like Somalia and Nicaragua and unfortunately Haiti, we see that GDP actually goes down over time. So their economy produces less over time. That's a problem. So the last thing I want to take a look at here, uh, or one of the last things I want to take a look at with GDP is just a comparison. So this is the real gross domestic product per capita in three different countries. We have the red line represents China, the green line represents South Korea, and the blue line is the United States. And we see that even though levels of GDP are really, really high in China, real GDP per person is not very high at all, which means standards of living in China are still relatively low compared to South Korea. And South Korea and China weren't all that far apart back in the 1960s, but now they're substantially different. One of the things we're going to talk about in a, in a week or so is why that difference exists. And then if you look at the United States, we've maintained this enormous gap over both countries in terms of real GDP per person over time. So that's the second thing that GDP does for us, is that it helps us to understand rates of growth. The third thing that GDP does for us is, oh, so sadly, we're going to have to wait until next time to hear about that third thing we use GDP for. It turns out my daughter's upstairs making a racket, and it's hard to make a video with that much noise. So, until next time, I encourage you to keep reading through chapters 10 and 11, and we will wrap up those two chapters with our next installment of Econ 1010 Online.